To bring back a trillion trees, we don't actually need to plant a trillion trees. The beauty of nature is that in many places, these trees can come back by themselves if only we allow this. Stop talking and start planning. That's the motto of today's guest, Felix Finkbinner. Felix is the founder of Plant for the Planet Initiative, a project he started when he was just nine years old. Today, 13 years later, he and his project are still dedicated to planting trees. A lot of trees, in fact. The total global count for the trees that they've planted since the foundation of the initiative is 14 billion. That's a huge amount of trees. But as a species, humanity uses around 15 billion trees each year. So to put that in perspective, that's like cutting down the equivalent of all the forests in Austria, the Czech Republic, Greece, Hungary, and the United Kingdom every year. As it stands now, we plant about 5 billion new trees a year. So how can we cover this 10 billion tree gap? And besides, we live in a world where we need an estimated 1 trillion more trees just to get a handle on the climate crisis. Felix joins us today to discuss these challenges, the effects of deforestation, and examples of successes his initiative is having around the world. Plus, he shares some stats that might surprise you. Right now, we have about 3 trillion total trees on spaceship Earth. So how are we going to add the next trillion? Tune in to today's episode to find out. This season of Hidden in Plain Sight is brought to you exclusively by our friends at Splunk, the data to everything platform. Splunk helps organizations worldwide turn data into doing. It's time for data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen. Learn more at splunk.com or by clicking the link in our show notes. Felix, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So when I look out at the world today, I see trees out there. And if I do some research, there are a lot of them, but they're still disappearing at a pretty alarming rate. So we are excited to have you here and kind of dig into this problem and this challenge that's facing us. So first of all, Felix, thanks for taking the time. Sure. I'm happy to. Felix, how did this problem get on your radar and how did you become so passionate about the work that you're doing? And tell us a little bit about it. I got into all of this a long time ago, uh, 13 years ago. At the time, I was uh, nine years old. I was in fourth grade. And my teacher asked me to give a, give a little talk in my class about the climate crisis. And when I prepared that talk, I found out about a woman from Kenya called Bangari Matai, who had started a movement that ended up planting 30 million trees across Kenya in, in 30 years. What she did is she paid women to plant trees, and therefore managed to use tree planting as a tool for women's empowerment. It's an incredibly impressive story for which she uh, received uh, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, actually. But, you know, I was, I was a nine-year-old and I didn't understand the, the complexity, the, the depth of her fantastic work. All I really took away was that planting trees helps, uh, helps tackle climate change because trees capture CO2. And because of that, I, I told my classmates that we should be planting one million trees in each country of the world as children. And many of my classmates liked the idea. Um, and a couple of weeks later, we planted our first tree. And that really um, kicked off quite a movement. Um, it, I think, it started because two local journalists uh, reported about our tree. That's how some other schools found out about it and planted some trees as well. And we found a, a slightly older student to support us who created a very simple website. And this website was essentially just a ranking among local schools of who had planted the most. And lots of schools wanted to outcompete their neighboring schools, um, and that's how Plant for the Planet spread. After one year, we had planted about 50,000 trees. After three years, a million, uh, and it spread from there. Felix, I think it's so cool that you attack this problem by planting a tree, right? <laughs> it's so easy these days to get lost in the planning and the preparation, and you just got started in a small way and then gamified the problem and invited others to comp compete and play this game with you of fighting deforestation and helping combat climate change. So kudos to you for that. That's very, very cool. When Thank you, you were really ramping up this effort and it started to formalize a bit more, what are some of the first 
pieces of data or research that you stumbled on that made you take a step back and say, wow, I had no idea that this problem was so pernicious or that it was such a threat to the world? The really interesting thing actually was that we had a really, we still do, but um, back then even worse, a very, a big lack of the important data. Uh, we have to address this. Got to be honest, though, at, at nine years old, uh, I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't notice. Um, it was just uh, many years later, once we started achieving this goal of the one million trees, that we really asked ourselves, uh, where do we go from here? What are the next steps? And in that process, we had some obvious questions, like how many trees even exist in the world and how many additional trees could we plant? And yeah, we obviously thought these were very simple questions, but soon noticed that there weren't any proper answers. The best count that existed for how many trees um, there were globally was about 400 billion. It came from a NASA study. But then by that time, another paper had come out that concluded that just in the Amazon, there are more than 400 billion trees. So we knew this number was totally wrong, but no one knew what the actual count was. But uh, we then actually linked up. We found uh, three awesome uh, scientists at Yale, and we managed to convince them, one of them. I believe, right? Yes, um, Tom Crowther, uh, Professor Tom Crowther, who's now a professor here in Europe at ETH Zurich, and he then um, started a three-year research project, which ended up um, being published in a journal Nature, and concluded that there are roughly three trillion trees globally. Three trillion trees, to put that in context, we used to have about six trillion trees. But that's also a part of it, a, a conclusion from his research. So about 11,000 years ago, after the last ice age, before humans started really cutting down forests, we used to have twice as many trees uh, globally as we have today. And the second big question that I mentioned was how many additional trees could we plant? You know, because ideally we'd bring back those six trillion trees, have six trillion trees again. But of course, that's not possible. We need land for, for agriculture, for settlements, and so on. What uh, Professor Crowd and his team did in their, um, in their continued research and then published a year ago in the journal Science was uh, where could we realistically re restore forests without competing with agriculture and so on. And in that process, they created a global map that concluded that we could restore about a trillion additional trees. So we can't come back from this 3 trillion to the 6 trillion, but we can get to 4 trillion trees. And that's our mission at Plant for the Planet, convince the world to restore those trillion trees. And I love that it's in strategic areas too, where you're not trying to compete with local economies or things and systems that are already rolling and contributing to deforestation. So if we take a step back and look at about how many trees we use collectively as a species a year, it's about 15 billion, I believe. And that number is uh, problematic because it appears that we plant 5 billion new trees a year. So I would love to get your comments on this 10 billion trees gap. And, you know, are these numbers accurate? Are they what you have heard? And how do we first close this gap and get to sustainability? Yeah, what you're mentioning, there are the, the best numbers we have available, that we lose about 10 billion trees every year. Um, these numbers are far from perfect. It's quite hard to get these accurate counts, but this is based on um, a satellite analysis of, of tree cover change around the world. To give you a sense of how much um, 10 billion uh, trees are, that's a bit more than the entire tree cover in Germany. So all of Germany has about 8 billion trees and we lose 10 billion trees every year. Um, yeah, and as you point out, this is like a, a dual problem. We need to stop deforestation as soon as possible and at the same time invest a lot in reforestation to combat all of that accumulated or a lot of that accumulated um, loss of the past, uh, past decades. And there are a wide range of different strategies we need to reduce uh, deforestation. Part of it is changing our consumption habits, right? The biggest driver for deforestation is meat consumption. Um, because for, to produce one, um, an equal amount of calories um, by eating meat or by consuming meat, we need much, much more land than if we consume the same amount of calories in some other like uh, vegetable-based form. Um, because if you, you know, 
grow wheat and then feed it to a cow, then a lot of that, that energy is lost in the life cycle of the cow um, instead of being gained by you know, the human eating um, that grain, essentially. So a big part of addressing climate change is reducing um, our meat consumption around the world. That is the most effective thing we can do, along with a, a, a few other products that massively contribute to deforestation, like palm oil, for instance. And another big part of it is also re in increasing the efficiency um, of the agriculture in those sectors. So less land is needed uh, for, for the same amount of product, and that reduces the pressure on, on, for new sites uh, for new deforestation. Sure. And Felix, how did this study and this pursuit lead you to Plant for the Planet and the initiatives that you're working on now? How did those initiatives come together and how did you lead that charge? So Plant for the Planet really kicked off with um, this uh, Jovian Youth Project we started uh, back then many years ago. But it has, of course, evolved a, a lot since then. We still have children, youth all around the world participating in Plant for the Planet and spreading our message. And to allow them to do so, we organize Plant for the Planet Academies. These are essentially one-day training sessions where we bring together uh, children and youth from local schools um, and teach them what the climate crisis is, what we have to, um, what they can do to help address this crisis, like, for instance, planting trees and motivate them to go out, plant trees, give speeches to convince others, and much more. So you've had 80,000 children in, in 74 countries participate in these um, training programs to spread out message. That's the one part um, of what we do at Plants for the Planet. A second big part of it, of our work, is getting the message out there for the importance um, of reforestation. That was a big part of our work over many years, but with the publicity about reforestation, around reforestation in the last few years, uh, we believe that to a large extent we've achieved that mission. Um, there was just a poll out um, in polling people in the U.S. Um, asking people what their preferred strategy of addressing the climate crisis is. And actually 90% of respondents answered um, that uh, restoring a trillion trees is a good strategy. So clearly the importance of forests, that message is out there. So that's less of a focus now. Our new main focus at Plant for the Planet is helping with the implementation of this massive uh, reforestation. And we have uh, two main ways uh, we, uh, we're addressing this. The first part is we're actively planting as many trees as possible. And because of that, we've set up a reforestation project on the Yucatan Peninsula in southern Mexico, where we have a staff of 100 people planting on average one tree every 15 seconds. That's over 2 million trees a year that we're planting there to bring back uh, a Mexican rainforest. That's an important part of what we do. And on top of that, uh, what we're trying to do is bring transparency not only to our own project in Mexico, but to lots of other projects like that by allowing people um, to discover what all of these projects are doing, where exactly these projects are, using satellite imagery to show people how these sites that are being planted on are changing over time so that people can get to know reforestation projects around the world, select their favorite ones, and then support them. So we built an app called the Plant for the Planet app that people can use to discover tree planting projects all around the world and then donate directly to these projects so they can plant more trees. So for each project, you'll see uh, what type of species they plant, where exactly they plant it, them, why they selected the, these sites and so on. And you'll see the price per tree and can donate directly to these projects. Very exciting. And when it comes to 2 million trees a year that you're, you all are planting, that is a lot. However, to get to a trillion, it's a huge next step. How are you going to get to a trillion? How many institutions, schools, and individuals need to get together and start planting trees in order to get to a trillion? Help paint a picture for us of how we get there. I think one important part of understanding this is that to bring back a trillion trees, we don't actually need to plant a trillion trees. Thank God it's a lot easier than that. Because the beauty of nature is that in many places, um, these trees can come back by themselves if only we allow this. Consider, consider this, for instance. If, uh, if a, a bit of rainforest uh, burns down in Brazil, but, uh, but around this burnt area, we still have... Uh, we still have rainforest and it just burned down 
which means that there's still a lot of seeds, a lot of uh, tree seeds in the soil. And, you know, there are, there's enough nitrogen and so on uh, still on the site. Then there's no need for us to come in there and plant trees because all resources are available and nature can automatically restore itself. In a lot of cases around the world, the, the only thing we need to do is allow this nature to come back automatically. Um, then at the other extreme of this are sites that are so degraded, they've not been forested in so long, or they've been destroyed so thoroughly, um, and there's, there are no seeds, no nearby forests from, from which seeds can blow in uh, you know, with, uh, with wind dispersal or with bird dispersal or insect dispersal, that these, tree, these trees cannot come back. Um, by themselves, um, then we need to um, plant trees there. And there's also a lot of in intervention types in the middle between those two extremes of the spectrum, like planting just a few individual trees that will then allow other trees to come back. So a really important part of this project is to, um, to get a good understanding of all of these sites around the world, understand how degraded they are, and what the best strategies are to bring back these forests so that we can reduce our work as much as possible and only really do tree planting where it's absolutely necessary and in all of these other places allow for natural regeneration. Sure. Are there any estimates about natural reforestation and how quickly it can occur? Are there any case studies you like to cite when someone asks, well, how quick can nature regrow itself? That's incredibly hard to answer uh, broadly. There are some uh, great academic studies to how quickly uh, biomass comes back. Um, the problem is that it varies a huge amount um, with a whole range of different factors. Generally, what can be said is that in tropical conditions, forests grow a lot faster, which means they capture a lot more CO2 every year, and they also achieve their maximum biomass um, per unit area much, much faster. So I think we could generally say that in a tropical condition, you can achieve that, uh, that biomass, um, most of that biomass, maybe around 80, 100 years after um, restoration sets in. And in temperate areas, it can take hundreds of years longer. Temperate areas are like the, the northern US. Sure. Felix, when it comes to dark data, so dark data is just this industry phrase for data that was being collected, but not currently being used in any models or decision-making. Uh, so when it comes to dark data in this industry in academia, where researchers are working on this problem, are there any examples you've heard of recently of new studies, um, new data sets that are becoming available or being incorporated in models? Um, any new dark data coming online? I'm not, not sure about that. I think what the fantastic part of the work that Trump Crowther has been spearheading over this, these years is not necessarily by surfacing new data, but by bringing data from researchers all around the world together into one shared database. That means that we can, um, instead of analyzing regional, local phenomenon, analyze phenomenon at a, at a global scale. Um, and of course, scientists are often quite protective of their data right. because they invest so much in collecting it. So ideally, you know, a lot of, a lot of academics want to keep that data for themselves and uh, personally analyze it instead of, uh, you know, allowing other people to analyze it. So a lot of effort often goes into um, encouraging scientists to work together in that way, share the data uh, and collaborate globally. And I think that is uh, part of the great work that, that Tom Crowley was able to do there. And what we are trying to do with this, this transparency platform, the Plant for the Planet app, I mentioned, is encourage tree planting organizations and restoration organizations around the world to start collecting standardized data all around the world, right? Every reforestation organization has some sort of method um, to quantify the work they do, but it's really hard to compare their quality and to do research globally based on, on this data because they all track different metrics and many of them actually track far too little. So what we are building at Plant for the Planet is on top of this, uh, this end user focused app where people can, can donate to tree planting projects is another app called the Tree Mapper app that allows projects to very easily um, collect data um, about their impact, about their work in a standardized way so that we can start to compare reforestation projects all around the world. 
and, and measure their impact globally. This is really exciting. So the standardized model that you and your teams have created for this data tracking and recording, uh, how did that come about? And you know, have you seen any cases where early adoption is especially promising? So what's really important here is that we haven't launched this yet. We're in the, in the final stages of the, developing this, uh, this, and we're gonna start this in, uh, in a few months. I guess the really important part here is that it's not revolutionary, right? We didn't develop new standards. We're just building on um, the know-how in, in the restoration community in, in general. And I think what sets us apart from other efforts is that we're combining these two things. We've developed this app that allows people to donate, to donate trees at the same time we've developed this data collection app. And what's important is that these projects will only be able to keep receiving donations uh, through our app from our community if they make the effort of collecting that data and making it publicly available. So we've we're not just providing a tool that allows them to easily collect the data about their project, but also creating that extra incentive to, to do that extra bit of work and to not just keep that data for yourself, but also make it publicly available to anyone, um, all researchers uh, and all donors. Um, and, and that will hopefully contribute to a much better understanding. Sure. And Felix, when it comes to the nitty gritty of planting trees and you know getting different species and you know rolling up your sleeves and doing the work yourself uh are you still actively planting trees and um if if so you know share us some stories about how people can get to the field and start planting trees quickly like is there can they download the app and find uh some actual physical locations that are recommended and begin planting um what's that process like so of course, I still get to plant a lot of trees myself, especially when I visit our work in Mexico and I'm on the ground there. Um, I'm working on my PhD right now, so as part of my research, a lot of, I, I get to plant a lot of trees. And I often plant together with school groups um, around the world um, as well. And it's always fantastic to plant trees yourself to get, get a sense um, of what that's like. But in general, the vast majority of people live in areas that are not super suitable for large-scale reforestation, right? So there is no big need for reforestation just outside of New York City or just outside of LA or just outside of most urban centers. And in Europe, more broadly- It's difficult and, to get going. Yeah, and in the US, um, the US is a slightly different story because there is actually um, a bit of a need for reforestation in the US itself. But in a lot of countries around the world, especially in countries of the global north, We've got quite good um, forestry systems that are taking quite good care of our forests. Much bigger needs are generally in countries of the global south. So if you want to contribute, absolutely plant a, a few trees yourself. But I think your focus should be on, on supporting reforestation efforts uh, in the global south. If that's um, probably most effectively by fundraising and donating to them, but you know, I'm sure a lot of them would also be excited about uh, getting volunteers. Sure. Felix, when it comes to deforestation, many people think of the rainforest first and foremost. Um, how are we doing in the battle against deforestation in the rainforest? Are local governments and groups starting to uh, be a little bit more cautious and careful with this? Are they replanting trees more? Where are we in the fight to save the rainforest? That's a complex story. And I think uh, Brazil, maybe the most important country um, in this context is a, is a great example for this. Between the years 2004 and 2014, the Brazilian government together with uh, fantastic local NGOs made massive gains in re reducing deforestation. In that decade, deforestation actually dropped by 70% in Brazil, 70%. That is an insane, wonderful success and really proves that it's possible um, for us to tackle this challenge. But then in 2000, um, yeah, shortly after this, um, the new Temea government came in and the Temea government already um, massively reduced these efforts, 
And then the Bolsonaro government, even worse, um, followed after that. And since then, uh, deforestation has picked up quite substantially again in Brazil. So this kind of shows that um, if local governments are willing, or if national governments are willing, in some of these uh, most important countries, uh, we can make quite an important dent there. Another rather interesting program is the efforts of the Norwegian government in that regard. The Norwegian government for the past couple of years has been working on our program where it provides uh, billions um, of dollars worth of funding um, to governments around the world with a lot of rainforests um, tied to goals in regards to uh, protecting these rainforests. Um, so this, this started a couple of years ago. Initially, it wasn't quite as successful um, as a lot of observers would have hoped, but you know, they're still tweaking their process. And I think that's generally a great role model for what uh, Western governments can contribute more broadly. Even though we don't have, often don't have a lot of rainforests in our own country, we all collectively, globally profit from these rainforests uh, remaining in place. So what we can do is provide these governments uh, with a lot of rainforests. With the funding, they need to protect these rainforests and then pay them um, to make those efforts. So I think that's a really interesting approach, and I'm very curious to see how, how that effort develops. And I think uh, governments like the American government and a lot of other European governments could provide a lot more funding of that type. Completely agree. And Felix, your slogan, uh, I assume you have many of them, but one of them that I like that you use is stop talking and start planting. So tell us a bit about that. And when it gets to the end of the day, in this massive problem that you're fighting, how do you kind of keep your perspective and remain patient while you're in the trenches doing this work? Yeah, so the slogan is actually part of a campaign we started many years ago. And the idea was we were a super young organization. How do we spread our message about, uh, about who we are? And what we did is whenever we met um, any sort of celebrity, we took photos where a young Plant for the Planet member, um, I did it quite a lot myself, um, covered the mouth um, of a prominent person and then just said, stop talking, start planting. And, you know, these photos traveled quite far. I took one, one such photo, for instance, once with the King of Spain and a lot of journalists were present and the day after it was in the, on the cover pages of many of the biggest newspapers in Spain and made us instantly famous um, in that country and led to a lot of support there. So uh, that's really how we've been, been using that slogan. But in regards to the second half of your question, right? It's, it's often quite hard to remain positive about this because we're still losing so many more trees uh, than we're bringing back every year. And in climate politics more generally, we've been making so little progress in the last few years. The governments of the world agreed on the incredibly important uh, Paris Accords in 2015, but now five years later, we've made embarrassing little uh, progress and actually achieving the, those goals uh, we pledged there. So it's, it's quite shameful. What we have achieved in the tree space is that a lot of people are now finally understanding the importance of preserving forests and in restoring forests around the world. But of course, that is the, the first and least important step. The much bigger um, work remains ahead in actually implementing this and bringing back these forests. When it comes to the specifics of planting a tree or planting many trees, is there a rough unit cost of labor, planting, um, logistics? Uh, are, any, are there any estimates that you have about how much it costs to plant one tree versus a million trees? Um, how does this problem scale and what are the costs associated with it? So obviously the main factor uh, in this are local labor costs and also site conditions. Uh, depending on how degraded the site is, um, yeah, the more degraded the site is, the more expensive it's going to be to bring back forests on that site. In our work in, in Yucatan, um, we've now really achieved uh, economies of scale, and we were able to uh, reduce the price to one euro per planted tree. And I don't think we're going to be able to reduce it um, much more than that. So it's just over a dollar per planted tree in Mexico. In some, some African countries, prices can be um, a bit lower than that. But that's a rough ballpark to help you. 
Uh, restoring in the U.S., of course, is going to be a lot more expensive. Sure. Felix, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk with us today. If there is any final thought or call to action you would have for our listeners, feel free to take the stage and would love to hear it. Yeah, I just want to encourage every, anyone to help us bring back these forests. Find your favorite uh, restoration organization around the world um, and donate to them. Allow them to plant more trees, bring back forests. And uh, yeah, we built the Plant for the Planet app for just that, to show you great organizations um, and support them um, or, you know, support us in our work in Mexico. Awesome work. Felix, thank you so much for joining us. And to everyone listening, we'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm Sophia Bush, and you've been listening to Hidden in Plain Sight from Mission.org. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Splunk, the data to everything platform. In today's data-driven world, every company, big or small, new or old, is sitting on terabytes of unused, untapped, and unknown data. Splunk helps turn all that data into action. Using cutting-edge AI and machine learning, Splunk delivers real-time predictive insights that will help you on your mission to change the world. With solutions for IT, security, Internet of Things, and business operations, Splunk empowers people to make faster, better decisions and take action to get things done. It's time for our data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen.